And to start, we've got Isabel Mooney from uh, 42 Crunch, uh, the founder and CTO. Uh, Isabel's joining us now. Hey, Isabel. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. So you're ready. Do you want to start sharing your slides or just uh, stay on for a sec? Okay, perfect. All right. I'll let you jump into it. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. And um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in, in this world. Um, so we're going to take the next 20 minutes and talk about API security and 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 in the API security stack. Um, the way I've organized this presentation is basically to go over some breaches, which are not uh, essentially from the financial world, but uh, on systems which are uh, financial grade. And then we'll learn from what happened to them and see what we have to do to protect our APIs. But before we do that, you know, I just want you know everybody to to be conscious of you know where do we stand in terms of API security today, and really um, what's happening is we we keep seeing and discovering new breaches every single day, right? If um, you know about API Security.io, which is a website actually my company curates to educate and report on on what's going on with APIs. Uh, we've been constantly for the past two years now reporting every single day problems with public API, whatever makes it to the news, really. But um, if you look across those 300 and, and others that we may not have reported uh, uh, upon, you will see they all have a common set of problems. And and basically, you know, 20 years into AppSec, we're still, you know, uh, not... Um, doing some basic things such as validation of all the data that comes our way, input validation, data validation, uh, doing authorization on all the data coming in, putting some proper rate limiting. And the combination usually of those multiple factors is what really threatens uh, APIs. So um, why you know this is happening and what is this so special about APIs? Well. The key thing is APIs have brought a new architecture into place in our applications, where normally what we would have been doing is have most of all the business logic on the back end and just render some HTML and JavaScript to present some results back into an application, whatever that application is. We switch that from um, to switch that to an architecture where the API is basically returning all this information that comes from our backend back to a client which is richer, more powerful, uh, and, and we tend to return to that backend, uh, from that backend, I'm sorry, all the information that the UI needs to present um, information. And a lot of the business logic that was on the server side now resides on the client side, right? Which basically means we're, you know, transporting raw data across the internet between our APIs and our applications, right? This is true in the fintech environment as well. Uh, we used to have banking applications that were residing within our bank or within our insurance, and I was talking to the information systems within that entity. And now we have, you know, fintech apps or bank apps because they're also doing that as well, which allows us through API to go and fetch information about our banking accounts, uh, syndicate information across multiple banks. So this is really the architecture that that we that BSD2 has enabled for us, which is great from an innovation perspective, but of course it it, it brings its challenges from a security perspective. Because traditionally what we've been doing in security what security people have been doing is protecting perimeters, right? So the, the role of security teams for the longest time has been to build walls around, um, you know, the, the core of our enterprise and, and building, you know, multiple series of walls so that if the first wall was falling, we'll have a second wall, you know, putting defense and depth basically in place. So, so that we would protect that core, and and you know the the entry points into the into our system were very much controlled, but with APIs, what we're doing is every time we're basically creating a new API, we're creating this new avenue in in into our system, 
Um, plus, we're also opening uh, avenues to the data that resides in other systems, right? So really, the focus of security has completely changed from protecting, sorry, uh, the perimeter from protecting the data, right? So how do we do security and what is API security? I just wanted to explain that a bit because I see a lot of confusion. Uh, API security is a very hot topic today. I see a lot of confusion of where does security apply? And really it applies at multiple levels. As you can imagine, it applies at the machine levels or the hardware physical access network that has not changed, right? On top of that, we'll have hypervisors, VMs, so different virtualization layers. There's also security that needs to happen there. And then there's application security. And really application security is two parts. It's about communication between the different parts of my application. And we'll talk about that with some of the, 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 the breaches that we are going to illustrate this uh, session with. And then there is app several security, which is more about the code, the libraries I'm using, the Docker images I'm using to build my application, uh, the, the data, how do I protect the data, authorization and authentication at the data level. So, so it's really a multiple uh, you know, layer approach. And, and frankly, one of the key messages I want to leave with you is you're really not secure if you're not looking at all of this, right? So you can have a super hardened machine which is locked down in the middle of Alaska, right, you know, and, and nobody can actually go and touch it. Uh, but if the application that runs on top is full of problems, that, that serves no purpose and vice versa, right? So it, it, you really have to look at security at all those different levels. Now, um, to illustrate the fact that API security is different and we have to center our, you know, attention on the data that manipulate, that the, the APIs are manipulating, uh, about a year ago now, um, the OWASP has released a new list of, of, of top 10 problems around APIs. And you will see the ones I have in orange here are very much related to data and data access and data leakage, et cetera. So without further ado, let's go and, and look at some things that have happened to certain companies uh, across uh, in, in the last year or so and, and understand what those problems can lead to and how do we protect ourselves from them. So the first example I have for you is from Uber. Um, so this happened about a year ago now. Um, this was a bug bounty, so no breach came out of this. But basically what the hacker was able to do was to take over any account just by knowing the phone number of, of, um, of an Uber driver. He started with that. And the reason he was able to do that is because the first problem is going and playing with the APIs hackers do to discover how the API is actually working. Um, it triggered an error in, in, in the backend that returned some information you see now on the screen saying, well, I can't answer to you, but in the error message, it puts some sensitive operation and sensitive information, which is this UID you can see here. So it's a very long number. By definition, a UID is a unique ID. It's not something I'm capable of guessing, right, as a hacker or as anybody else. So it's a very long a number that you know has billions of combinations but the error here is to leak that basically through the api and through that what they were able to do was to then you know exercise on the other part of the api and and then get another leakage that was giving all kind of information about that driver including a, a basically a, a login token a mobile token used to log into the account and that was basically game over right um, so the first problem here, and this is top one. So API one is like the number one on, on, on the actual list of problem with APIs. And it's a very critical one to understand and very relevant in the business in, in which, in which we, you know, we're focusing today, which is banking or insurance and, um, fintechs in, in general, which is, if I, if I am authorized to, uh, as Isabel, I'm, I'm authenticated to, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, an application and I have a valid token, so I can call the APIs, all is good, right? But I'm trying to now access the bank account details of something which is not mine. I'm trying to get into Mark's, you know, Mark's uh, account. I should not be allowed to do that, obviously, right? Because my account, I, I own certain account numbers, but of course I don't, even if I have valid credentials, I'm not allowed to account, allow 
sorry, to access the account of somebody else. So uh, one of the greatest problems in APIs today is the capability of enumerating accounts and scrapping data through that, right? And, and basically, at the very core, this is an authorization problem. That is, every time we access some resources, we have to make sure that the user or system was trying to access that as proper authorization to actually do this. And we can take some additional measures to make sure that those IDs are not enumerable, right? So actually, in the Uber account uh, case, they did that well because that ID is a very complex UID that I cannot guess. But we see a lot of cases um, in, in, in the customers we work with when those ideas came directly from the backend systems and therefore are easily enumerated. So just make sure you know um, every single time there a resource is to be accessed that you validate that uh, the user is properly authorized to actually do that. And and if you know and rate limiting can also help you here to mitigate some of those effects. Um, uh, just to make sure nobody can enumerate forever and, and get millions of records uh, by enumerating data. Um, the other issue here in, in that problem, and this is again one of the top ones, is we're returning some data back through our APIs. Um, and, and a lot of applications basically said, back to what I said about architecture, um, oh, so, so now my client is responsible for cleaning up the data, basically. So I can just return through the API all kind of information. It will be the role of the app to actually clean up or, or take whatever they're interested in. And that makes it easier from an EPR architecture perspective because I have basically one endpoint and I return all the information about an Uber driver in this case, or it could be all the information about a user, an account, whatever it is. And then the client side will take the two, three, four fields that they're actually interested in, as opposed to just delivering the information they just need, right? So you have to be very careful here, just take control of those schemas, take control of that data, and make sure you approve any piece of data that needs to be returned through an API. And we have to do that extra job of just returning whatever we're interested in uh, to exploit on the client side and not the entire thing. So don't count on the client to filter anything because obviously if I call the API directly, that filtering is not in place, right? And be aware if you're using GraphQL, right? And on, on what I can ask in terms of data. So you don't return to me all the backend information and, and the contents of the database because I asked for it, right? Um, and, and, and true is also the same thing for JWTs. JWTs are used to transport information. So make sure you don't put in a JWT a lot of JSON data that is also being returned to the client side. Um, so just use opaque tokens instead that don't contain any information. Uh, and then um, use internally JWTs that are not going to be published to the on the client side. All right, uh, next one is on uh, Facebook. So what is the problem here? Uh, it's a huge problem with basically authentication. So again, this is a bug bounty. It's not um, an attack um, that got into, a, it's in a breach, sorry. Um, um, and what happened here is uh, something also which is, you know, it's, it's very easy for anyone to be bitten by this which is to leave some endpoints and some things open that uh, we forget about because we opened them for testing, or it's an old version, or whatever it was. And in this case, this is another endpoint, which is a beta of the API that you know developers can use to, to see what's coming next um, from Facebook on their API. And, and what they have done is they have left that uh, beta thing not protected properly so that it was you know, easy for a hacker basically to um, hack the password reset and take control of an account. So even if there is two-factor authentication and password reset in place, then that, that's where the, the, the problem was. So the, the first thing is, um, in terms of authentication, you really have to understand what is the correct authentication for my, for my API, right? Um, we want to use two-factor authentication. This is a must now with SCA, right, for, for banking. Um, are we using CAPTCHAs or, you know, and it all depends on the operation and the data and how you're using this actually API, right? So just make sure all the credentials, they're 
properly stored um, and it cannot be hacked and, and stolen. Uh, make sure you don't use long-lived access token that can be stolen and replayed. Here we had 10 minutes, okay, to to steal the token. Um, you know, maybe we have to do something shorter uh, than that to limit basically the the scope and the window that hackers have to take advantage of that information. Right? We want to use mutual TLS whenever applicable. Um, that's not always applicable because it's a requirement in terms of knowing and controlling who is talking to you. But if you have the ability to do that, it's another layer that, that can be very useful. And of course, we want to use OAuth properly. We could do an entire session just that, on that topic. But you know about FAPI, you know about financial grade APIs, and there you have tons of recommendations on what is the proper way of using OAuth, right? The same thing, you have a proper way of validating any token coming your way. Um, and there's a full RFC now on, on JWT validation just to make sure nobody can forge JWT sending them your way and, and trick you into accepting them, right? Um, so be careful with URLs, right? This is also a very important thing. Uh, we tend to forget anything sensitive has no place in a URL, right? Why? Because this is going to end up in all the logs, um, in, in all the, you know, it's going to, leak all over the place and it's very easy to be beaten by this right so anything sensitive never in a query parameter it's always in the header it's always in the body but never in a header parameter all right and um and another way of protecting ourselves is also rate limiting right so again here the problem is we have an endpoint that rate limiting is not in place we have to put that rate limiting in place all over the place and we have to put smart rate limiting in place um, so, so especially if any of you here is doing any rate limiting by IPs, you know, look at how you can do this differently, maybe. Because IPs are super easy to A, forge, B, create. Uh, I can take a credit card, go on any public cloud and spin up through a script, you know, 5,000 machines in, in, in half an hour and they will all have different IPs and I can bring them down in five minutes and bring 5,000 more the next five minutes. So it's super easy to forge IPs and, and create new machines. Uh, so look at how you can do this uh, differently in, in your APIs. Um, and OK, I, th I think <clears throat> on, on um, and the last point I wanted to talk about is maybe more known, which is everything related to input validation, as we were talking about. So injections and all that stuff we know about. Um, we look at this. so. The, the key you know, learning point here from what happened to Equifax and many more through that Apache stretch problem is in, in valid, uh, no validation of a content type header. So it, it is you know, very critical that you really, really test every piece of data that comes your way. There is no trust, basically, by default in any of the information that you receive. Wherever it's coming from, if it's internal, it's trusted partners, it's whoever, I don't care really, you have to validate that every request that comes your way is actually what you're expecting, okay? Um, you also want to make sure you, you know, have TLS on by default, you set up all your systems. So the, the API 7 um, is really about also, which was the problem that, that has bitten Equifax and others, is that problem in Apache struts had been fixed um, like for six months when they got the problem. And the problem is that they didn't update the systems, right? So you have to be very careful about this. Just make sure you control everything that you reuse and make sure that everything that you reuse is actually something you can you you trust and you have in your own repository that you know doesn't have known vulnerabilities. So you don't get bitten by the vulnerabilities that you may have in your code, but by vulnerabilities that you're actually importing in your code through all kind of means. Libraries you're reusing, images you're reusing, um, all you know, everything that you bring from the outside and you bring inside your application is a potentially a danger. So you you don't want to trust any of those and you want to validate them. Okay. And I'm getting at the end of my time. Um, so in terms of um, validation, yeah, I mentioned that. So everything that you receive, you want to validate 
Should it be headers, input requests, anything you want to validate? That is really critical. And those are really the top three, top four things that really you have to take care about. This is like 80% of the problems that we see with APIs today. And, and one thing which is not really a problem, but this is very critical. If you're being bitten by anything, um, you want to have a trace of it. You need to be able to detect that something has happened. You need to be able to go back to the root of what has happened. And you won't be able to do that unless you have logs and you have information but, uh, about all the traffic that comes into your system. So just make sure this is there. In, in many of your cases, well, this is mandatory from, from a compliance point of view. That might not be true of all of you. So even if you're not forced into it by compliance, this is really something you have to do, OK? So final thoughts on this. Um, what do we see are making a big difference in, in how API security is done? Well, the first one is really to start early. We see too many cases where security is like an afterthought. The APIs are written, you know, we're against the clock for any compliance delivery, business pressure, whatever it is. And we look at, you know, validating security way too late for that to be efficient, okay? So we really have to start worrying about this way earlier in the life cycle. And, and you know, in, it's in your interest as well because the cost to fix that, like any problem in production is actually uh, much higher if you discover this in production than if you discover it in development, right? Then you have to do to yourselves what hackers will do to you. You, you have to hack yourselves. What I mean by that is, well, all, you know, uh, worrying about the happy path and making sure functionally your API is actually working. But really we have to hammer our APIs with all kinds of bad stuff. You know, like, which is exactly what hackers will do. Bad data, expired tokens, invalid information, you know. That's the only way you're going to discover those bolas and, and those, um, you know, the, the IDOR type problems and see if you really validate the data, et cetera. It's just to do this on your to yourselves, right? And, and finally, and, and Mark was talking about this, DevOps and DevSecOps, right? You probably have now hundreds of APIs. There is no way you're going to do security on all of those manually. You have to start putting in place proper practices so every time a new API exists and it's being brought into development, you have automated security validations applied to those, right? And, and it's part of the everyday life. Uh, security is ingrained in, in our API development. So we don't have to really think about it. As a developer, I push my code and all kinds of magic things will happen just to make sure my API is actually more secure, OK? And with that, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to take some questions if there are any. OK, that was fantastic. Thanks, Isabel. The uh, just one quick one first was so of, of well, though I've got two questions, so I don't know which to go with. I'll go with the dependencies. You talked about the, you know, that is a huge risk all the way through. Um, is there any uh, product offering way or, or is there any best practices around how you keep an inventory of all of the all of the dependencies that you're relying on? There, there, there is. So there's a lot of difference. So this is a very long problem. It has its own category of products, which is called Software Component Analysis, SCA. Um, GitHub adds this now in grain inside their environment, for example, that will analyze your code and find the dependencies and, if, and recommend you to go from version 1.2 to 1.3. Uh, SNCC is another example of that, white source. So th there's a there is a, a bunch of uh, commercial examples on doing that. So yeah, you're, you're not alone there. You can rely on, on very mature solutions. <coughs> <to this>. I... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just coughing there. Um, okay, great. Look, we're about to run over time. I will actually ask my second question though. Um, I can't see any others so in the stage, but by all means, anyone? Oh yes, great, there is. Wouldn't it be a great idea to serve an automated security scanner specifically targeting open banking APIs? Or, or are there already such services, Patrick asks? Don't come talk to me. That's what my company is doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're doing that based on open <coughs> API. It's not specific for banking. But uh, yes, we, we, we can actually do this kind of uh, 
of security scanning. Um, so come, come ping me, I'll, I'll let you know. And that's 42crunch.com? Yep. Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Let's um, uh, move along now uh, so that we're staying on time. Thanks for sticking within the time limits and yeah, always great care. to share a stage I mean, with you, Isabel. Thanks. Bye. Um,